Spider-Man PS4 is a video game that has taken the world by storm and one of the most anticipated and exciting parts of a superhero video game's release is always getting to find out which alternate costumes made the cut, hoping to find your particular favourite Spider-Man suit, whether it be the ever popular 2099 costume, the Iron Spider suit from Avengers Infinity War, or the ever divisive bombastic Bagman from the early 2000s games, which is the best, don't at me. However, while these alternate Spidey suits may be exciting, it's always hard to overlook the classic design. The iconic Spider-Man costume has remained largely unchanged since the character's inception in 1962, which serves as a testament to the genius of its design, becoming one of the most instantly recognisable costumes in all of popular media. That being said though, there is actually a fascinating history behind the creation of the original Spider-Man suit which in turn raises the question of whether the credit behind its brilliance should actually be attributed to the character's creators, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, or if in fact its creation is entirely trapped inside a web of lies. We've touched on the history of Marvel Comics in several different videos now, and this particular story picks up not long after the breakout success of the Fantastic Four in 1961. With Marvel's first family being a huge commercial success, Marvel's editor Stan Lee began working on a plethora of new heroes to stand alongside the Four. According to Lee, he wanted to focus on characters that a largely teenage slash young adult readership could relate to, in order to differentiate itself from the more godlike heroes over at DC, and sought to tackle everyday social problems that Marvel's readers would face, as well as telling exciting stories with colourful superheroes. I think perhaps the main reason mm. was the I can relate to him, because mm. he was shy, he wasn't that successful with girls, he mm. had to worry about his family. Mm. I think most teenagers reading it thought to themselves, hey, that could be me. However, the story of how Lee came up with the idea of a Spider-Man type hero to fill this role isn't entirely set in stone. In many interviews, Lee has recalled how he became inspired by watching a spider climb up a wall in his office, though this picturesque story was somewhat debunked in his 2002 autobiography, Excelsior, The Amazing Life of Stan Lee, writing that he had told that story so often that he'd become unsure of whether or not it was actually true. What we do know though, is that Lee looked to previous comics as inspiration. For instance, in his autobiography, he also claims that the 1930s pulp hero, The Spider, was a huge inspiration for his new hero. However, there was another character which seemingly served as a much greater inspiration for Spider-Man, one created by Lee's frequent collaborator, Jack Kirby. By this point in time, Jack Kirby was already a huge name in the comic book industry. Alongside writer Joe Simon, he had created one of the genre's most popular and defining heroes, Captain America, and had worked in the industry for over two decades, experiencing both the highs of the Golden Age boom during the war years and the steep decline that followed in the 1950s. Interestingly, in 1959, in the period of time between Kirby's exit from Marvel and him joining DC Comics, Joe Simon was approached by Archie Comics, who, after seeing the return of DC superheroes and the birth of the Silver Age with the debut of Barry Allen The Flash several years earlier, sought to enlist both himself and Kirby to create a new superhero title. One of the ideas that Simon and Kirby pitched to Archie was for a character named the Silver Spider, based on a character that Simon had first envisaged alongside Captain Marvel's co-creator C.C. Beck several years earlier. In his 2003 book, Comic Book Makers, Simon recounts how, in 1953, I created a superhero, a young man with spider-like qualities. I put the character in a presentation for a publisher and entitled it Spider-Man. I had Beck do the penciled sketches. He was the predominant artist for Captain Marvel, the man who gave Captain Marvel its special comic style, and I believe he came out of semi-retirement to work with me on this. At the last minute, I changed the name from Spider-Man to the Silver Spider. I thought at the time there were just too many man titles around. Superman, Batman, that stuff. I took the presentation up to Harvey Comics, where it languished. But upon receiving the offer from Archie Comics, 
Simon and Kirby revise this pitch and propose an updated version of the Silver Spider, with comic book historian Brian Cronin suggesting that Kirby actually wanted to publish the character as Spider-Man. However, the character was ultimately published under the name The Fly, first appearing in The Double Life of Private Strong issue 1 in June of 1959, before receiving his own solo title later that year. And while the Fly character bears very little similarities to Marvel Spider-Man in any real way, the notion of a spider-themed hero may have laid dormant inside the mind of Jack Kirby, ready to be reborn at a later date. And this is where things get particularly interesting. You see, once Lee had decided on the premise of a spider-themed hero, which artist did he turn to to bring the character to life? While Steve Ditko ultimately drew the initial appearances of the character and is rightfully credited as co-creator, Lee actually first turned to Jack Kirby to help envisage his spider hero. As Brian Cronin recounts, Fast forward a few years and Stanley is looking for a teen superhero for Marvel Comics. He asks Kirby to come up with some ideas and Kirby remembers the Silver Spider story and pitches it to Lee. Lee is interested and asks Kirby to work up a proposal. Lee determined that the superhero Kirby came up with was too traditional, so he gave Kirby's proposal to Steve Ditko, who remarked to Lee that the premise sounded an awful lot like the Adventures of the Fly series from Archie. You see, Lee had come to Kirby with the basic pitch, a young superhero with the powers of a spider, and as became commonplace in their collaboration, wanted Kirby to further develop the idea and bring it to life in only the way that he could. The problem here though is that Kirby's rendition of their spider-themed hero was strikingly similar to the Fly character that he had worked on with Joe Simon previously. So much so that, according to Sean Howe, when Ditko was brought on to revise the Spider-Man concept, he immediately noticed the problem. Howe writes that, When Lee asked Steve Ditko to ink the first six penciled pages of Kirby's latest feature, Ditko pointed out that the concept, a teenage orphan with a magic ring that transforms him into an adult superhero, was a retread of The Fly, a character that Kirby had already done for Archie Comics in 1959. However, while Lee was never shy about Kirby's initial involvements in the creation of Spider-Man, he has never claimed that any similarities to The Fly is what led to the decision to give artwork duties over to Steve Ditko, instead citing it as a question of fit. In an interview for the 2002 documentary, Stanley's Mutants, Monsters and Marvels, he notes that while Kirby did in fact provide a sketch for a Spider-Man design, it was simply too bold, muscular and heroic for the unlikely hero that Lee had created in his mind. On the other hand though, Kirby for many years seemed to hold a sense of resentment towards his involvement in the creation of Spider-Man, frequently citing himself as a co-creator. For instance, in a 1990 interview in the Comics Journal, he recalled how I created Spider-Man, we decided to give it to Steve Ditko, I drew the first Spider-Man cover, I created the character, I created the costume, I created all those books, but I couldn't draw them all. We decided to give the book to Steve Ditko, who was the right man for the job. He did a wonderful job on that. Regardless though, Ditko's involvement in the character is where many of the essential elements of Spider-Man was born. In a 1965 interview for comic fan entitled Steve Ditko, A Portrait of the Master, the artist recalled how Stanley thought the name up, added the costume, the web gimmick on the wrists, and the spider signal. And with that, Spider-Man swung onto the pages and into the hearts of comic fans almost immediately in his August 1962 debut in Amazing Fantasy number 15. The issue, which was supposed to be the last of the series due to poor sales, proved to be one of Marvel's highest selling issues at the time, prompting the company to announce Spidey's own solo title, with issue 1 of The Amazing Spider-Man, released in March of 1963. And the rest, as they say, is history. But, is that really it? What have I told you there's another twist to this tale? One that could throw the entire creation of Spider-Man into huge scrutiny. 
In 2006, a comic book and toy dealer by the name of John Cimino bought a collection from an anonymous seller, which included a 1960s era Spider-Man costume, among various other collectible garments. Now, why is this so important, you ask? Well, the costume in question came with a catalogue containing other Halloween costumes created by the company, Ben Cooper Incorporated, which advertised a similar looking Spider-Man costume to the one that Sabino had purchased, though this one dated 1954, which is eight whole years before the debut of Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy 15. According to a write-up in the New York Post, Samino initially thought the costume was simply a prototype and was never actually produced until he received a call from a seller who had once owned a five and dime store and had some leftover inventory in an old barn and stashed among the piles of inventory were a few old Ben Cooper Halloween costumes which just happened to include that same Spider-Man costume from 1954. And this begs the question, if this costume is in fact real then this could suggest that Steve Ditko and Stan Lee may have saw it and used it as a template for their Spider-Man character design after discarding the one initially proposed by Jack Kirby. Samino notes that Ben Cooper was 10 miles away from Marvel's offices. Ben Cooper ruled Halloween in New York City, so Ditko had to have seen this costume. When he got the assignment for Spider-Man, maybe something came back when he was designing it because it's so much like the Ben Cooper. And where this story gets even weirder is the fact that in 1963, the same year that Spider-Man received his own solo title, Marvel struck a licensing deal to produce official Spider-Man Halloween costumes for children. And with which company was this deal struck? Ben Cooper Incorporated. The costume Samino had initially purchased was the official 1963 version, which looks like the original Spider-Man costume as you'd expect, while the 1954 lookalike maintains a lot of the same features, but has a distinct yellow and blue colour palette as opposed to Spidey's classic red and blue. Upon his discovery, Samino actually reached out to Steve Ditko about the similarities, hoping that the late artist would be able to shed some light on the subject. Samino did actually receive a reply from the notoriously withdrawn Ditko, but it simply wrote that the burden of proof is on the person who makes the assertion, claim, or charge. Some clippings, etc. are not rational proof of anything, but some clippings, etc. And while we can't say for certain that any of the assertions made here are factual, it is possible to create a hypothetical timeline of what may have happened. For instance, as Samino notes, it is highly likely that someone at Marvel did in fact see the Ben Cooper 1954 costume, and after Lee had rejected Kirby's initial sketches for Spider-Man due to either the overly masculine depiction or the overbearing similarities to the fly, Ditko took aspects of the aforementioned costume and incorporated them into his design, creating a notably different look for their new superhero as to what was traditionally expected. Again, while there are compelling arguments to support this assertion, it is important to note that much of this is still largely speculation, and therefore should be taken as such. And in truth, there is an argument to be made that all of this was just one giant coincidence. There is no shortage of other characters in popular fiction who have been spider-themed. This dates back to the aforementioned pulp hero from the 1930s. In fact, Fawcett Comics even featured a Captain Marvel villain called Spider-Man back in 1947, and the issue where the character appeared had cover art by C.C. Beck. Yes, the same man who had initially created the Silver Spider character alongside Joe Simon. But that's a topic for another video. It all makes sense. It all makes perfect sense now. The secret behind this Ben Cooper costume conspiracy is right here. And if you want to get to the bottom of this Ben Cooper Spider-Man costume mystery, come check out the video I made over on my channel, NerdSync. It's going to be a fun time, I promise. But regardless, I think this stands as a testament to the brilliance of the original Spider-Man design. No matter who was the first to come up with it, that some 56 years after the character's debut, Spidey remains not only an incredibly popular superhero, 
but his costume has, for the most part, remained unchanged, cementing it as not only a symbol of the beloved character, but of the entire medium that it represents, also. Hey everyone, thank you for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like and also leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought about the video and if you have any questions or theories or if you just want to chat about what we discussed today, please do so and I'll be more than happy to get back to you. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. We make weekly videos like the one you're watching and you may have seen the little stinger we did with Scott from NerdSync. And that's because he's actually made a really interesting video discussing the Ben Cooper Spider-Man Halloween costume controversy from a different perspective I think you guys might enjoy a different take on the subject there will be a link to that on screen along with some other videos you might like if you did indeed enjoy this one and you can find a written version of this video on my website owenlikescomics.com you can follow me on twitter just at owenlikescomics and that's all for me I will see you all next time so until then take care and keep reading